I am Shomojit Patro, working in Shidhu Kanu Bhishra University of Puduria district of West Bengal as an assistant professor in sociology. I will talk about research questions and testing hypothesis. You know the purpose of any scientific research is to modify, contribute or enrich the existing stock of knowledge through proper inquiry directed by the properly framed research questions. Science has no absolutes, there is no absolute in science, it is always cumulative. Now, what are research questions? Researchers have many queries and curiosities in their mind and they try to reach at some satisfactory and valid answers and solutions of these after a careful and meticulous analysis of the relevant data collected through appropriate methods. Research questions are specific questions framed during the initial phase of the research, the answers of which a researcher tries to find out. The research questions set the direction of the entire research process. We can argue following Alan Dryman that a research question is a question that provides an explicit statement of what it is the researcher wants to know about. A research purpose can be presented as a statement, but a question forces the researcher to be more explicit about what is to be investigated. However, mere selection of research topic does not direct a researcher to the actual methods to be followed and the specific areas to look for collecting data. It may be worth noting that research involves certain definite stages and a researcher starts framing research questions and hypothesis after selection of topic and review of existing literature. Selection of research topic which is the elementary task of any research is however, not an easy task. One has to go through the existing literatures to find out the gaps in research. A researcher has to be very precise in focusing his or her attention while framing research questions. When after going through the existing literatures on the concerned area, the researcher finally specifies the objectives of the study. He or she is better able to frame his or her research questions. Research questions can also be framed on the basis of common sense. Dave House has provided us with some examples that can guide us in developing research questions particularly for descriptive researches. These are what is the time frame of our research? What is the geographical location of our interest? Is our interest in broad description or in comparing and specifying patterns for subgroups? What aspect of the topic are we interested in? How abstract is our interest? The research questions of explanatory studies mostly focus on delving the causal relationships between different variables. Naturally, the why questions are more important in explanatory research than the what questions, which forms the basis of descriptive studies. However, the suggestions of Ramakrishna Mukherjee can be helpful for formulating research questions for any type of research in social sciences. Calling his approach as inductive inferential method, Ramakrishna Mukherjee argues that a social scientist should try to find out the answer of the following questions. What is it? How is it? Why is it? What will it be? And lastly, what should it be? 
for obvious reasons when a researcher deals with the first two questions that is what is it and how is it the orientation of our research is descriptive and classificatory. As soon as she incorporates the question why is it her work becomes more explanatory in its spirit. When a social scientist's research question include the fourth and fifth questions as well, it becomes a diagnostic study. There can be a reasonable debate among the positivists regarding the inclusion of the fifth question as they believe that the questions like what should it be involve value judgments. However, you can understand that a comprehensive research should be based on all the questions mentioned above. In many cases, the researchers deal with a number of research questions, but do not clearly state which questions are more important or how the questions are related. Such a multiplicity of questions can lead to the problem of lack of focus. The researcher should select a number of research questions for her or his study considering the time cost labor components of his work. Time, labor and cost of the study would proportionately increase with the increase in the number of research questions. Too many research questions are difficult to manage as well. Now I shall discuss the features of research questions. Research questions should be interrogative in nature. It should not be declarative. For example, it should be like this. What is the relationship between educational level and the attitude towards the freedom of media? A statement like there may be some relationship between educational level and attitude towards freedom of media is not a research question. Next, research question should be based on the objectives of the study. Research questions should not divert the attention of the researcher from the basic objectives of the study. It should rather try to delve deep into the problem. Then research questions should be specific. There should not be any ambiguity in the research questions. It should be easily understandable and precise as much as possible. And finally, it should be simple but well structured. Much of the success of a research depends on the research questions. It should be focused and precisely framed. The fallacy of many questions that means aiming at more than one inquiry in a single question should be avoided. The questions should be structured in such a manner that they help the researcher unveil a specific dimension of the problem. Now, we shall learn the difference between research questions and hypothesis. Both research questions and hypothesis are useful in social science research. The difference between them is that while research questions are interrogative in its form, hypothesis are declarative statements which are intended to be tested during the course of research. Hypothesis can be restructured in the form of questions, but then one should not call it hypothesis. Now, what is hypothesis? When a researcher conceptualizes her research problems, she thinks about it in general terms. Research questions or hypothesis help look at the specific aspects of the problem. So, hypothesis or research questions enable us to carry out meaningful analysis. Hypotheses are specific statements about the problem made at the initial stage of the research, which may be proved right or wrong at the end of the analysis. Hypotheses are formulated at the third stage of the research process. According to Goody and Hatt, a hypothesis states what we are looking for. They write, it is a proposition which can be put to a test to determine its validity. Hypotheses are primary assumptions about the interrelations of different variables 
which set the direction of the entire research process. It may be noted that a variable is simply an attribute on which cases vary. Cases can obviously be people, but they can also include things such as households, cities, organizations, schools and nations. If an attribute does not vary, it is a constant. Once a hypothesis assumes a relationship between two or more variables, the validity of such assumption made on the basis of the personal experiences, knowledge and insights of the researcher is tested through suitable statistical techniques. If the primary assumption are proved correct after the analysis of the data, they become part of the theory. So, it is said that hypothesis provides the link between the empirical world and the theory. Hypothesis formulation and testing are closely associated with the quantitative approach to study social phenomena. Note the feature of a good hypothesis. A hypothesis is the assumption made about the relationship between different variables on the basis of existing knowledge or common sense. But all declarative statements or assumptions are not hypothesis. Let us look at some examples. Example 1, first hypothesis, the rate of dropout is higher among the girl students. Another hypothesis, the rate of dropout varies with gender with the girl students having a higher dropout rate. The first assumption is not an example of a good hypothesis as it does not clearly state the two variables, but the second one is a better one because it clearly mentions gender and rate of dropout as two variables and a relationship between them is assumed. The features of good hypothesis are as follows. One, hypothesis generally states or predicts the relationship between two variables. Two, it is expressed as a statement, not as a question. Three, hypothesis should be clearly stated, specific and conceptually clear. Next, it should be consistent with the known laws of nature. And last, hypothesis is testable. After the final analysis, it may prove to be correct or incorrect. Now, I will talk about the sources of hypothesis. Hypothesis are not ordinary or casual statements about the empirical reality. They emerge through a systematic and logical process. According to Goode and Hatt, there are four possible sources from which hypothesis can emerge. First, culture can furnish hypothesis. Every human society has some distinctive cultural traits. Many social science research focus on human behavior or on meaningful social actions, folk ways, modes, values, customs, belief patterns can help formulate hypothesis in these studies. Hypothesis can emerge from the science itself. In the backdrop of any research, there should be one or more theories. Hypotheses are often deducted from a theory to verify or modify some of its basic conclusions. Goode and Hatt opine that the socialization process that a students of a particular discipline undergoes teaches her or him about the promising areas, paradigms, laws, analytical categories, concepts and methods of that particular discipline. This knowledge can help the student to assume some possible causal relationships between some variables that he or she can put to a test for verification. Hypothesis can be formulated from analogies. Analogies between human society and nature between two different types of communities, etc., are often a fertile source of hypothesis. For obvious reasons, the researcher should take care in making such analogies. Analogies should not be illogical, 
it should on the other hand be consistent with the known laws of nature. Next, hypothesis can come out from idiosyncratic personal experiences of the researcher. The scientist lives in a particular culture or she can encounter some cultural traits of some other cultures. Her personal experiences can also help her to formulate effective hypothesis. Now, let us learn about the types of hypothesis. Hypothesis can be classified in many ways. Goode and Hatt categorize them into three types on the basis of the level of abstraction. A. Hypothesis that state the existence of empirical uniformities. Generally, these hypotheses are framed when the researchers want to test the common sense propositions. In other words, sometimes the researchers are interested to establish the parallels between what people think about a phenomenon and what actually exists. These often lead to the observations of simple differences. In these hypotheses, sometimes common sense ideas are put into well defined concepts and then the hypotheses are statistically verified. B. Hypothesis that is concerned with complex ideal types. These hypotheses try to focus on the logically assumed relationships existing among empirical uniformities. In particular, these hypotheses led to specific coincidences of observations. For obvious reasons, these types of hypotheses deal with a higher level of abstraction than the hypotheses that are concerned with the existence of empirical uniformities. See, hypothesis that is concerned with the relationship between analytical variables. According to Goode and Hatt, these hypotheses deal with the highest level of abstraction. In this case, the researcher analytically formulates a hypothesis that shows a relationship between changes in one aspect of the phenomenon with the actual or assumed changes in other aspects. P. K. Mujumdar has categorized hypothesis into two types, eliminative or analytic induction and enumerative induction. In the former case, hypotheses are formulated as universal generalization and the presence of any contrary evidence leads to its rejection. In case of enumerative induction, a complete enumeration is required to accept or reject the hypothesis. A researcher formulates a number of hypotheses, sometimes called experimental hypothesis, and all these hypotheses are tested on the basis of data collected for the study. When a researcher wants to test the hypothesis with the help of some statistical techniques, he or she frames what is called null hypothesis. According to Earl Babi, in connection with hypothesis testing and tests of statistical significance, the hypothesis that suggests that there is no relationship among the variables under study is called null hypothesis. Sometimes null hypothesis states that there is no difference between the two variables. Now, I will show you some examples. First example, null hypothesis denoted by H 0. There is no difference between the percentage of male students and percentage of female students who have got 50 percent marks in research methodology course. If the data collected for the study show, for example, that in reality there are differences between percentage of male students and percentage of female students who have scored 50 percent in research methodology course, there are statistical techniques to determine whether the difference found is statistically significant or whether we can ignore the difference attributing it simply to chance factors 
and accept the null hypothesis denoted as H0. If the difference obtained from the collected data is statistically significant, the researcher rejects the null hypothesis and accepts the alternative hypothesis. For obvious reasons, there may be more than one alternative hypothesis denoted by H1, H2, H3, etc. The researcher has to select any one from among the alternatives if the null hypothesis H0 is rejected. The following are the examples. Alternative hypothesis H1. There is significant difference between the percentage of male students and percentage of female students who have got 50 percent marks in research methodology course. Or alternative hypothesis H2. The percentage of male students is higher than the percentage of female students who have got 50 percent marks in research methodology course. Or alternative hypothesis H3. The percentage of female students is higher than the percentage of male students who have got 50 percent marks in research methodology course. It is not always easy to accept a hypothesis from among the alternatives. The researchers often has to find out what is called crucial instance to take a final decision regarding the acceptance of a hypothesis from among a number of options or alternative hypothesis. Sometimes they have to go through an experiment to decide what, what actually would be the alternative hypothesis. In the above example, whether H2 is correct or H3 is correct, it should be noted that both H2 and H3 cannot be correct at the same time. The experiment which finally helps to come to a conclusion regarding which one should be accepted reasonably from among the hypothesis is called experimentum crucis. There are a number of statistical techniques like z test, t test, chi square test to test the null hypothesis. Now, type 1 and type 2 error. Although, in case of quantitative research, the researcher specifies the variables and put the null hypothesis to test using some statistical techniques. There are dangers of reaching at wrong decisions even if the researcher resort to scientific techniques in the testing of hypothesis. He or she can commit two types of errors, type 1 error or type 2 error in this regard. When the researcher accepts a hypothesis, when it is actually incorrect, it is called type 1 error. In case of type 2 error, the test result tells the researcher to reject a hypothesis when it is actually correct. Let us now discuss the relationship between hypothesis and qualitative research. It has been said that hypothesis is generally associated with quantitative research, but it should be wrong to assume that in qualitative research they are irrelevant. Some qualitative research aims at describing the nature, context and consequences of social interactions and social relationships and the process of creation of meanings. These studies also start with some assumptions about the social realities which can be treated as hypothesis. Obviously, these hypotheses do not indicate the relationship between variables. Hypothesis testing in qualitative research is a continuous process. This is a, the process of analytical induction where contrary evidences or what is called crucial instances challenge the conclusions of previous study, they are modified or rejected. New hypotheses are then framed in the light of new information or experiences and again their validity is checked. The topic of any research which the title of the dissertation indicates actually indicates the broad area of the research. It is not very difficult to 
decide upon the broad area of research, but the researcher has to be very specific in concentrating on the specific particular area of his or her research. Research questions or hypothesis help the researcher to concentrate on the very specific area of his or her research. He or she has to test, there are different statistical techniques to test hypothesis. The researcher has to test the hypothesis in course of his research with the help of the data collected. But they have to be very serious, very cautious about framing the research questions and hypothesis because any mistake can lead to devastating misleading conclusions.